so in um, chapters 9 through 12, these were pretty um, extensive chapters, so there was a lot of detail. I suspect um, it took you um, a bit of time as well to, to read it as it did I, uh, at least for notes. So um, let me kind of just walk you through um, my take of the reading, and um, we'll kind of go from there. So, <coughs> here's the overview. Um, basically, chapter 9 tries to look at this curious fact that we've had um, at least four credit bubbles over the past 30 years, and that this is pretty unusual. And that many of you in this class may not be accustomed to thinking of it that way because in your lifetime, you've only experienced one the one in 2008. And what it, chapter 9 tries to do, as, as you'll see in the slides here, is it tries to um, draw a connection between um, each of the bubbles and how the deflation of one bubble spilled over to the creation of a new bubble. Then chapter 10 starts to then look at the idea, okay, if we have these credit bubbles, if they are... Um, recurring, and if there is a general form that they have, um, what should we do about it? And that would be what chapter 11 and 12 look at. <coughs> Two perspectives on how you would try to resolve a credit bubble, one with a lender of last resort as a central bank, and um, chapter 12, a lender of last resort um, from an international perspective, which is typically the um, International Monetary Fund, the IMF. <coughs> okay, so let's look at what were these bubbles and what connections, if any, can be um, made between them. And Really what we see here is um, a rapid growth in bank loans in Mexico and other Latin American developing countries that then leads to a, <coughs> a credit bubble that exists most notably in Japan, which leads to a bubble in Thailand, Indonesia, and South Korea and other East Asian countries. And then a bubble in um, the dot-com bubble um, here in the United States in the late 1990s with a final connection to whether we can connect the real estate bubble that was experienced in 2008 to all of that. So it's really these waves, these continual waves, and that this is pretty unique. <laughs> So it's not, although it's not unusual to have asset price bubbles, they obviously don't happen all that often. Um, with the first one in 1987 in the United States, not having been experienced since the 1920s, and Japan having one starting in the late 1980s and never having had one before that. And what's even more unusual is that you would have a bubble occurring in several countries at the same time as we did in the uh, Mexico-Latin America debt crisis and as we had in the East Asian financial crisis. And what we know, what we already do know um, from the previous chapters is that the way that these credit bubbles emerge is that there has to be money there first. There has to be a large pool of money that you can start to borrow against. Then there has to be something sudden that happens, a shock, that leads to a change, a sudden change in the rate of return. And then as people try to accommodate that sudden change in return, there has to be more individuals who then step in to lend more money to that group. Each credit bubble has those three components. That is the commonality. That co those commonalities are important when we come to talking about um, whether bubbles should be um, popped before they actually emerge. <coughs> 
So let's look first at um, Mexico. So in Mexico, what we saw is that there was a, um, that Mexico as a developing country had um, borrowed a lot of money. And it borrowed a lot of money um, to build up its infrastructure and basically boost the economy to um, an industrialized country. And what preceded that was the fact that um, the Bretton Woods Agreement had been reached. So Bretton Woods was important because what that did is it, um, after World War II, um, all exchange rates were linked to the value of the U.S. dollar. And the Bretton Woods Agreement broke that, um, broke that agreement between them all. So now exchange rates were completely flexible. And what that meant then is that money would flow across country borders. And what was also unique at the time is that the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the United States, did have a limit on the interest rate in the United States. And now if money can go across country borders, why wouldn't it go somewhere else outside of the U.S., still have be denominated in U.S. dollars, but get a higher interest rate? Like, of course they would. But what's critical then is what do those offshore banks do with the money? They lent it to Mexico. They lent it to Brazil. They lent it to Argentina, three countries of which borrowed more than what they were able to um, do. <laughs> Plus, what we're going to see here is that these offshore banks had a lot of money to lend out. And they had a lot of money to lend out because they were getting all of their money from oil producing countries that were getting higher prices for the oil that they were selling. And what became a critical mistake for Mexico was that it borrowed money, but it borrowed money in U.S. dollars. That becomes important because it has no control over the value of the dollar. It can make as many Mexican pesos as it wants. So it it's kind of out of its hand how much its debt load is going to be because it all depends on what the um, value of the dollar is going to be. And between 75 and 82, Latin American debt to commercial banks increased at an annual rate of 20%. That's pretty significant and obviously clearly exceeded the ability to manage that debt. Now, as I, as I already indicated, these offshore banks, they just had a lot of money and they were kind of basically chasing loans. Um, they were chasing... Um, countries to lend out to so they could earn a positive rate of return. And what that meant is that they were willing to make loans to countries like Mexico, Argentina, um, Venezuela. Um, they were willing to make these loans because they hoped that the infrastructure investments were going to take off and that the country would be able to pay off um, the loans. And what then changes everything is when Mexico announces in 1982 that it cannot borrow any more money. It cannot pay off the debt. And what that does is it requires the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to intervene and restructure the debt. And the problem with the IMF intervening for most of these developing countries is that they then, to get the loan that they need, to basically restructure their debt so they can actually service it and pay it off, the IMF imposes certain conditions. One of those conditions being that they have to um, reduce government spending, even if the spending is not that high. <coughs> I just want to show you... <clears throat> There's a pretty good... Um, IMF video um, about what had happened in Jamaica. Obviously, you wouldn't want to go on the IMF site because they're going to say everything worked out fantastically. Um, 
but I just want to find the one I was looking for. There was a um, a rather long movie. We're not going to watch that. Um, but Jamaica is kind of a. Um, Uh, kind of a outside of what happened with Mexico is kind of a classic example of the concern we need to have um, about the IMF. The United States and the IMF moved to destabilize Jamaica's radical government with disastrous consequences for the population. Welcome back to Elite Jamaica, the place you come to learn about Jamaica and Jamaicans. If it's your first time joining me here, consider subscribing to the channel by clicking that red subscribe button. And do remember to turn on notifications by clicking that bell icon so you never miss any of my updates. Dude, I don't know about you, but we should probably all go to Jamaica. Jamaica looks pretty uh, fantastic, although not too different in terms of temperature in terms of Hawaii. I'm on the mission. <laughs> when Michael Manley and his People's National Party, the PNP, were elected in Jamaica for a second term in December 1976, all who challenged the racism and the imperialism walked tall. It showed that the country backed his refusal to adhere to the repressive terms demanded by the International Monetary Fund. So, uh, just to keep in mind, with Jamaica's history, um, it was part of the British Commonwealth. Um, it's obviously a developing um, country in the Caribbean. Um, and um, basically, if you're a developing country, you really, you want the money that the IMF has to provide, but you don't want all the restrictions that they impose. The IMF. We're not for sale, he announced to a cheering crowd of 35,000 at the National Stadium in the capital, Kingston. As long as this party is in power, we intend to walk through the world on our feet and not on our knees. At the time, Manley was recognized as the Socialist International's most important representative in the third world. So already, when you hear that, what you should be thinking of here is that most of the money provided to the IMF comes from the United States and Western Europe. So the moment a country says that we're a developing country that's also socialist, obviously the US and Western Europe get pretty grumpy about that. Um, they're not gonna say we're not gonna give you the money because you're socialist, but they're not gonna be all buddy-buddy with you either because they obviously don't want the government taking over private corporations um, in those developing countries. But this was a test case for both the IMF and the anti-imperialist movement. The proposed IMF Structural Adjustment Program for Jamaica was to be a model for neoliberalism and global debt negotiations throughout the third world. So what he said, right, sorry I keep interrupting this, but there, there's quite a few things here that um, he's saying. He talked about the Structural, uh, structural Adjustment Program. Um, you would have noticed that that was talked about in Chapter 12. Um, I will be talking about that in a little bit. The story of the rise and demise of Manley's battle with the IMF is rich in lessons for today's anti-globalization movement. Jamaica is a tiny island nation in the Caribbean, the home of Bob Marley, reggae music, and the birthplace of pioneering black nationalist leader Marcus Garvey. Ever since Christopher Columbus landed and mistakenly thought that he was in India over 500 years ago, the Caribbean islands have also been the object of colonialist occupation and exploitation. Michael Manley was a symbol of resistance, not only in Jamaica, but internationally. He first came to office in the 1972 election. Manley's early years in power saw a number of important progressive reforms for the population. The previous ban on Marxist and black power literature was lifted. Secondary education was made free and accessible, and a partial land reform policy was enacted. The foreign-owned electricity, telephone, and bus companies were all nationalized. In January of 1974, Manley's government announced a plan to alter the system of tax breaks offered to U.S. and Canadian bauxite companies here in Jamaica. These companies mined aluminum for the war industry. So the PNP annulled previous agreements and imposed a production levy on all bauxite mined are processed in Jamaica. So 
similar to what Mexico had. Mexico had a lot of oil. The U.S. wanted that oil. So they invest heavily in the United States. Um, or U.S. oil companies invest heavily in Mexico. They then lend money to the Mexican government to build the infrastructure that they will then use to get the oil out of the country, right? Like building ports and pipes and stuff like that. Same thing's happening here in Jamaica. And again, I'm not trying to be um, <coughs> critical here of U.S. policy, but um, I think it's a reasonable criticism to say that the IMF is largely servicing the companies that are investing in these developing countries. And what's happening here is um, some like Canadian and U.S. companies wanted the natural minerals bauxite for aluminum that Jamaica had, um, and they're obviously going to need an infrastructure to support that natural resource extraction. This ruling, though, severely provoked the anger of the U.S. and other ruling classes. A massive and now well-documented destabilization campaign followed. Aluminum and bauxite processing were shifted to other locations. The levy was claimed to be illegal and contested by the bauxite companies, which filed actions with the World Bank by the bauxite companies, which filed shifted to other locations. Sorry, um, but obviously um, this um, person um, has an accurate slide. Um, I would like you to focus on the last two bullet points, which would be IMF believing that they need to develop more infrastructure, IMF saying we'll give you loans for it, but we're going to impose lots of restrictions on you when you try to pay it back. <laughs> the levy was claimed to be illegal and contested by the bauxite companies, which filed actions with the World Bank's International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Local businesses, which had gone part way with Manly and the nationalization of foreign businesses, now buckled and found common cause with their international allies. Layoffs and soaring price increases set off an inflammatory spiral that wiped out previous waste wage increases. Foreign capital inflow plummeted, and the CIA became involved with fermenting local political rivalries. A terror campaign was unleashed as young Jamaica Labour Party members found ready access. So this is a pretty um, accurate... Um, uh, cartoon, which would be basically saying, this is how much you're spending, and this Jamaican is driving this uh, vehicle in terms of spending off the cliff, meaning you're spending way too much money, and this rich, rich IMF guy, because he's got the Monopoly hat on, the rich, rich IMF person is saying, okay, we lent you the money, but we still have a few concerns, stop spending so much money. Access to weapons in our guns for ganja trade. At first, Manley attempted to hold a steady course, fueled by popular support among Jamaica's working class and peasantry. The radical prime minister resisted the terms of an IMF reform package. In the December... Um, right there, that was the International Development Bank um, that's largely U.S. funded. Um, here's their International Monetary Fund with the conditionalities of all the things they have to do. And is the government worried that it can't meet the um, conditions imposed by the IMF and by the International Development Bank? Even though this is a Jamaican example, it equally applies to Mexico at this time and Argentina at this time. On package. In the December 1976 election, Manley was re-elected in a landslide, winning 47 of the 60 seats in the parliament. But after Manley's refusal to adhere to the terms of the IMF, the economy was strangled by sanctions while a media campaign sent a wave of fear among potential tourists. Layoffs increased, interest rates skyrocketed, and everything from soap to canned fish was in desperately short supply. This was the limit of social democratic reform. Manley would soon prove an unreliable ally of the poor and the working class and there would not be sufficient independent organization among the mass of Jamaican working class to steer their own course when he started to retreat. In 1977, Manley announced Jamaica's People's Plan for economic and political reform. Despite radical rhetoric, by May of that year, Jamaica had accepted an IMF standby agreement of 38 million pounds to ease the balance of payments crisis. So they got 30 million pounds um from the IMF. Uh, they needed pounds because, again, it was a um, 
uh, independent, largely independent Jamaican colony. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, British colony. The IMF re-established a line of credit with massive strings attached. This line of credit was conditional on an attack on the standard of living of. And then what this video is kind of critiquing here is how the government basically aligned itself and did the bidding of the IMF to. Uh, the best way to, to kind of gingerly put this would be to screw over um, workers in the country um, and most notably um, cut government spending by reducing the pension for government workers. Of the population, the poorest were it the hardest, with a dramatic cut in public spending as a leading edge of the program. As Jamaica was put to various IMF tests, repeated failures led to more and more regulation of the island's domestic economic programs. Confusion and despair is spread among Jamaica's population, especially young students and the poorest sections of workers and peasants. Political violence and the fortunes of the black market soared. By the election of October 1980, the JLP under the leadership of Edward Siago was back in office and with the largest margin of victory in its history, 52 seats to the PNP's eight. Only a year earlier, revolutions in Grenada and Nicaragua indicated that there was a growing mood of opposition to the U.S. dominated market model in the region. But uh, that's Christine Lagarde, um, the uh, former, I believe she's the former um, president of the um, IMF. Uh, she is uh, French. No, Jamaica had set a pattern of moving halfway in opposing the grip of the imperialist market and then backing down. The JLP Siaga government was welcomed by the U.S. as a new model of the times. Now, this is actually a pretty important picture, and I'm not sure the maker of this YouTube video was intending this, but it obviously it, it, this establishes a connection then between the financial crisis that exists in Mexico, Jamaica, other Caribbean countries, Latin American countries, and what happened um, in Japan. Because as you see there in the corner, we have BOJ, Bank of Japan here, which is also giving money. And what it's trying to do <coughs> is stop the um, dollar from falling in value and the yen becoming more um, expensive. Primarily because Japan wants the yen to be cheap because they are heavily dependent on exports. And that's obviously going to be part of the problem um, for Japan a few years after this picture exists in time. This ex picture would exist in the early 80s. Obviously, Japan is going to face its problems in 1987. This gave confidence to the likes of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and heralded the rise of neoliberalism. At the end of the eight years of manless democratic socialism, the average income in Jamaica was 25% lower and the cost of living, 320. Um, so this is kind of, the reason why I picked on Jamaica is, um, and, and we'll get to it when we get to chapter 12, but um, basically the IMF has given money to Jamaica many times, um, and it still has done nothing to get Jamaica out of its economic problems. So the IMF has been ineffective in helping the country get out of its developing status. 20% higher. <laughs> like many social democratic governments before and since, Manly's reformist politics proved incapable of mounting the challenge needed to add the force of global capital. But at the end of Siaga's term, Jamaica had paid out a total of £443 million pounds sterling to its former creditors, including £176 million pounds sterling to the IMF. Jamaica's foreign debt had grown to over £2.2 billion pounds sterling among the highest per capita in the world. It was in this context that Manley returned as Prime Minister to lead another PNP government in 1989. Manley had abandoned the left rhetoric of his earlier government. Instead, the market was seen as a triumphant model to pursue. However, even on the terms set by the IMF, Jamaica had clearly failed to meet anticipated development goals. Rather than economic prosperity, Jamaica endured further decades of insufferable poverty. And so basically, again, this is now a critique uh, by this YouTube author of what the IMF has basically done to Jamaica, which I think is fair criticism among many economists that Jamaica was a poor example of the IMF being effective and that it basically worked to advantage 
the companies that had operations in that country and that it hurt the people that lived in those countries. Poverty. Today, even the IMF's own economists are starting to recognize the problem. Dude, I just said that. In a 2006 IMF commissioned working paper, Public Debt and Productivity, Difficult Quest for Growth in Jamaica, Arthur Rudolph Blavi struggles with the apparent puzzle of Jamaica's low growth rates. He concludes that perhaps massive debt might have something to do with it, noting that Jamaica is among the most in-debt countries in the world. Today, we're in a new period of radical reform in the global south. There are certainly many similarities between the politics of Hugo Chavez and the first government of Michael Manley. But there are also differences. Venezuela has far more resources than Jamaica. The U.S. is a less powerful player relative to its competitors in a world economy than 30 years ago. And if there is a strong independent movement of workers and the poor, the forces of resistance may well have a better chance of staying the course. But the history of Jamaica's battle with the IMF makes it clear that if the grip of imperialism is to be definitively challenged, it must be replaced with another system based on... So I'll end it here, but basically you can see that the IMF is most concerned about getting the debt lower and lower and lower and building up the reserves. And that's totally fine, and you would want that to help the country develop, but it does hurt the people living in those countries if there's no social safety net. Like, who is the government working for then, and why is it collecting um, the revenues that it is? Um, not to build on this, but I... Um, as a macroeconomist, <laughs> um, inflation is pretty uh, boring. But the Jamaicans, to control currents, uh, currency inflation, um, inflation, they made their own um, public service announcements about why there should be no inflation. For some of you who've had me for class, I've already showed this, but. You can see it again. <laughs> inflation is to the economy what the baseline is to reggae music. I don't know anything about um, reggae music, but if what he's saying about the baseline is true, um, low and stable inflation is absolutely essential to a growing economy, so then I would infer from that that the baseline is incredibly important to reggae music. That sounds very technical. Um, oh, hey, there's the second one. Looks like the same actors. Take it down. Reggae music is the heartbeat of the country. Low and stable inflation is, is the, the heartbeat, heartbeat of, of the, the economy. economy. Uh, I suspect if these were your professors for this class, this class would be a lot more interesting uh, than it is. But what they say is true, um, that low and stable inflation is the heartbeat of the economy. I cannot agree more than that. Um, <coughs> but in a lot less interesting way than what they're just saying. Okay, let's go back to the slides. <coughs> okay. So what this does then is there's a connection then, economists think, and certainly in the book it was argued, that there's a connection between um, what was happening in Latin America and the... Um, basic bailout that had to occur on an international basis of Jamaica and uh, Mexico and other countries, um, that it also created a asset bubble in Japan. An asset bubble that we know occurred because of real estate prices and stock prices um, that accelerated rapidly um, in the closing years of the 1980s and then burst in 1992. <laughs> and it's only today 
that we actually see that land prices um, about some 20, um, what, some about 26, 27 years later, do we see that land prices have started to increase from what they were in the 1980s? So I guess if you waited out long enough, you can make back, you can reduce all your losses. Now, what caused this asset bubble that was in Japan? And it obviously affected Hawaii quite greatly um, in terms of real estate here. <clears throat> um, what economists used to think was that the Bank of Japan was ineffective at controlling the money supply, that basically they had screwed up. And just when they should have reduced the amount of credit, the, there was a stock market crash in the United States and that concerns about a recession stopped the Bank of Japan from doing what it should have done. And by keeping the credit there, the um, asset bubble continued to get larger. Um, I think most economists today believe that instead what happened is that the yen um, strongly appreciated in value, and it appreciated in value because of uh, regulatory changes that were imposed in the United States. <laughs> so, this one, I haven't seen the movie, but, sorry I keep showing you videos, but, um, you know, kind of when I'm trying, when I'm reading the book, and obviously I know the econ behind it, but I'm trying then to look for, you know, kind of a way to spice up the lecture beyond just me talking about slides. Um, I haven't, I, I do watch a lot of Netflix, but I haven't watched uh, this movie, Earthquake Bird. Um, but it's, uh, at least from this video, it actually was a pretty good description of what Japan looked like in the late 1980s when there was this asset bubble. Besides the three leads, there's another constant that runs through the psychological thriller Earthquake Bird. Japan, specifically Japan in the late 1980s, is a real presence throughout the film. Sometimes it's awe-inspiring for the characters, and sometimes it's incredibly disorienting. Which is kind of fitting, because in the 1980s, a massive bubble economy was remaking Japan into this awesome, extravagant, dizzying party. A party that was about to go off the rails. This is a taste of Japan during the bubble. Party. That's the word that keeps coming up when you read articles about the bubble. And it's one reason this big party scene made it into Earthquake Bird. Even the macroeconomic parts of the story feel like party goers taking things just a bit too far. This is a super simplified version of what happened, but the bubble got its start in 1985, at a time when Japanese goods were selling like crazy around the world. Uh, absolutely true, as we we're going to see here in the slides. Um, Japanese goods were selling quite a bit. Exports were incredibly high because the yen was pretty cheap. And America didn't like that so much. Also true. At a trade summit that year, the U.S. got Japan to agree to weaken the... Um, so we're going to talk about this in the slides here. I guess I could have showed this video a little bit later. Um, but um, what you're going to see here is that the sudden change, the new theory of economists behind the what caused the Japanese asset bubble to deflate rapidly was the Plaza Accord is passed. After the United States gets upset about how cheap Japanese goods are. And it causes... Um, the Japanese economy to have to be stimulated to keep the Japanese yen cheaper to help the exporters. The dollar relative to the yen, so that maybe, just maybe, American goods could sell like crazy around the world too. Dude, I just said that. But in agreeing to that, Japan risked a recession, so they slashed interest rates to prevent the yen from getting too strong. And that caused this. Seemingly everyone in Japan and their uncles suddenly rushed out for a loan, and hyper-competitive and even reckless banks were eager to dole them out. People bought land, and then used that land to secure further loans, with which they bought stock and more land. So basically, um, sorry, go back to here. Frenzy, which you can almost see in the charts. The real estate and stock markets tripled. 
Um, so the banks are lending the money to individuals, as we see here in Chapter 9, and I'll talk about in the slides, that then lends the money that people borrow money to buy land, and then they use the value of that land as collateral um, to then buy the stocks. For the loans with which they bought stock and more land, it was a buying frenzy, which you can all see in the charts. The real estate and stock markets tripled in value in just a few years. And there are these stories that make tangible the obscene amount of wealth in Japan during the time. It's hard to even tell if they're true or not, but they're still revealing in how extra they are. To hail a cab in downtown Tokyo, it said that you had to wave a 10,000 yen bill in the air, 100 bucks, just to get a driver's attention. If you drop that same bill on the ground in the hottest neighborhood of Ginza, it was allegedly worth less than the tiny patch of sidewalk it covered. The grounds of the Imperial Palace, which weren't ever going to be. Dude, that's pretty amazing. Going to be for sale were somehow worth more than the entire state of California. And that's an example that's obviously talked about in the book. And the land in Greater Tokyo was four times more valuable than the entire United States. Yep, the whole country. Dude, where was Alaska and Hawaii? You can imagine it made this search for an affordable apartment pretty difficult. It even began to spill over as Japanese companies bought up parts of the globe, starting small, just a skyscraper or two, then graduating to golf courses, movie studios, and finally even landmarks like Rockefeller Center. If commercials are a window into a nation's soul, and I like to think they are, then I submit to you that this famous energy drink commercial shows just how triumphant Japan felt when they belt out stuff like this. But what was daily life like for those who lived in the bubble? Well, that too was often a... In Bubble Japan, there was apparently a lot of time and money spent on earthly pleasures in nightlife districts like Ginza or Shinjuku, which was a fairly dramatic shift for a culture that had previously emphasized saving and community. Food was big, and it became increasingly extravagant. In some places, after dinner coffee was served sprinkled with gold dust for 500 bucks, but drinking may have been even bigger. This chart shows what Japanese workers use their wages for, both at the height of the bubble and 30 years. Dude, look at that. That's pretty crazy. Um, I mean, I knew that the Japanese liked to drink, but dude, half your money spent on drinking? That better be some really good whiskey. Later. Check out the 19- Dude, I just said that! <laughs> at the ever-popular karaoke lounge at the site of a scene or two in Earthquake Bird. To give you some idea of how much people were going out, in just one of those bubble years, Japanese businessmen charged $50 billion in food and drink to their company's expense accounts. But it wasn't just business. The Japanese were known connoisseurs of personal luxury items as well. And as you can see, their fashion tended to be dialed up. This suit is objectively the greatest costume in cinema. One big trend for women at the time was called bodycon, body conscious, tight, revealing, form-fitting clothing that often made its way to a dance floor. And those dance floors were epic. Like Studio 54 in the 70s, they somehow captured the times. People on the internet still swap stories about Juliana's, a cavernous club in Tokyo that came to symbolize the bubble and where basically anything could happen. But like any really wild party, there's always a crash. The stock bubble popped first, causing a cascade of bankruptcies everywhere. And just one year later, people had stopped buying those extravagances they had once lusted over. Then bad stuff started oozing out from under the glitz. There were tales of inequality, corporate corruption, and Yakuza infiltration. And yes, there was even plain old murder, although in real life it tended to happen over real estate. It took Japan at least a decade to recover from its hangover. and. Even in 2019, the stock market is nowhere near its 1989 height. Still, even with all the lows that follow... It's, it's obviously longer than a decade. We're talking about three decades here. It's hard to watch 
Yeah, I could live without that kind of party. Um, okay, let's go back to this. <laughs> so, basically a lot of what we just saw in the video in which I added commentary to, um, we see in the slides here, but um, the U.S., to, to put it lightly, they did kind of um, harm Japan for their own good because uh, the United States was concerned about the trade deficit and how much Japan was exporting and they weren't buying enough U.S. stuff. So the Plaza Accord was basically a way to get the yen to appreciate, become more expensive so that Americans would stop buying Japanese stuff because it was more expensive than U.S. stuff. And what that does is it weakens the economy, which then causes decline in property values, in the Nikkei index, the stock market. And what you see is that as a way to um, counteract that, there was an increase in the money supply. And banks lent out more money in the beginning, but that actually made the problem even worse. <clears throat> um, I've already said most of this right here, so I will skip this slide knowing that you um, already have it available to you. Um, but basically, the Plaza Accord sounds great if you're a politician because it makes it sound like we're really um, making sure that trade deficits between the U.S. and Japan are are reduced, but all it really did was it hurt Japan. And it hurt Japan by causing the yen to appreciate. Um, for any asset bubble, you need to have some event happening again that fundamentally changes thing. And that's what I bolded here on this slide. Um, Leading up to it, you have the banks trying to do all they can to get more people to borrow money, including the fact that you can extend uh, the loan to a three-generation loan, a hundred-year loan. Well, eventually at some point, the central bank is concerned about how the ownership of property is being concentrated among a few individuals, and then attempts are made to... Um, stop banks from lending out so much money for real estate and that causes individuals then to say we better sell our real estate while we can and they sell it as quick as they can and the prices fall to reflect the fact that people are unloading their property as quickly as they can. That's then connected to that crisis and the popping of that bubble is then connected to the East Asian financial crisis. <laughs> because what happens here is that as the Japanese bubble is bursting in 1991, 1992, 1993, other Asian countries that were dependent on Japan's strength in the Pacific region um, were also being hurt. So they had to extend how long their loan terms were as they were trying to grow and industrialize. And additionally, this big flood of money comes in to give to countries like Thailand and Indonesia and South Korea because investors for the first time, which had always invested in the United States or Western European countries, all of a sudden said that the only way we can get high enough of a return is if we start to invest in the top um, companies in industrializing countries. Um, so, right, so you could be the... Um, to put a modern day example, um, in Mongolia, a developing country, um, the top company is the mobile phone service, Mobicom, and it obviously makes a lot of money and it's a pretty good business to be in because even in the developing country, everyone still wants their cell phone. So what if I, as a firm selling investments, created a a fund, an investment fund that people could buy that has the top companies in developing countries, what we would call an emerging market fund. 
And what starts to happen here is that all this money starts to flood into these emerging market funds because everyone is chasing higher returns. And again, at the same time, you have the Plaza Accord that's in strong effect here. Um, interest rates in the United States then start to become higher as the Japanese are not borrowing so much. And as the U.S. rates become higher, then all of a sudden there's less money in emerging market funds. And that basically hurts then these emerging economies because all of a sudden the money that was there in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, is no longer there in the later 1990s. And it really happens and starts happening in 1997 when the Thai bot collapses because there's not enough U.S. dollars uh, to support it. And then our friends again, the IMF comes in and it forces um, – most notably Thailand and South Korea, to make changes. <clears throat> um, not to try to go too far back, but... Um, Well, I guess this actually keeps it pretty, um, um, I haven't, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to sh start showing this. Um, I'll add some commentary. I haven't watched it yet, but what is kind of appealing to me for this is that it actually, um, so this would be a pretty conservative website, um, pretty conservative author. So that would mean it would probably balance out just even my own personal assessment of what's going on with the IMF. So kind of balances at least the discussion a little bit because I'm sure there's some people who really like the IMF and some people who obviously do not. Now let's consider what has been one of the landmark financial crises of... Well, apparently he gives a lecture much like I do, so it's obviously not going to be as exciting as Jamaica in low and stable inflation. But let's uh, start this off here and see where we end up. Of our time, <laughs> namely the Asian financial crisis of 1997. You can think of the Asian financial crisis as being marked by a very rapid reversal of private capital flows. So earlier in the 1990s, you have a group of countries such as Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and South Korea. They basically have rapid economic growth, a very rapid inflow of capital. And yet when the financial crisis comes in 1997, those capital flows are going to be reversed. And that will wrench these economies in a very dramatic, very volatile. So the inflows of capital are coming in because they're coming in from the private equity firms uh, that created this emerging market financial product um away to see the size of that capital reversal let's look at the current account balance for five asian nations south korea indonesia malaysia thailand and the philippines and of course that current account balance is simply the mirror image of capital flowing in and out of these countries so 1994 the current account deficit is about 24 billion dollars so there's 24 billion of capital flowing in that number is higher yet in 1995 so again it's tracking how much is coming from these emerging market funds um, coming into the country from abroad um, that's causing the current account to get smaller and smaller and smaller and obviously pretty negative. And also in 1996, you can see the capital inflows heating up. But then, whoops, here comes 1997. Dude, never say whoops in a lecture. It's usually a bad sign. The onset of the Asian financial crisis, the capital inflow is slowing down. It's falling to $26 billion. And again, that's mirrored in the current account balance. And then finally, by 1998, where the crisis has now been fully in operation, we see the current account deficit has gone away altogether. It is now a current account surplus, and that is reflecting capital leaving these Asian nations as part of that financial crisis. Part of this Asian financial crisis was the collapse of fixed exchange rates. A lot of these currencies had been trading at par with the U.S. dollar and were pegged as such. But finally... So, again, what's happening here then is that just because the money is coming in uh, because of emerging market funds, 
then when the U.S. interest rate starts to become higher, the money stops going into um, these emerging economies. The speculative flows against these currencies became so strong, the peg snapped. And in some cases, you see the value of these currencies falling by at least 70%, which of course is quite dramatic. In these Asian economies, we also see a high degree of credit crunch and bankruptcies. Essentially, there were many corporations and also many banks which were significantly overextended, had often borrowed denominated in terms of foreign currencies. And when these currencies and also stock markets collapsed, they were basically hung out to dry these companies with, with too much debt and prospects of revenue which had been systematically overestimated. If we ask, what were the fundamental causes of this capital reversal? This is still a little mysterious, but I would say it was basically the ongoing revelation of unsound debts in many of these nations and unsound policies and unsound currency pegs, and also a general series of contagion effects where investors realized that the problems of one Asian nation were in fact reflecting the problems of other Asian nations. And you have this sudden chain of a kind of information revelation where investors are realizing that they had been overestimating the prospects of these countries. The capital is then pulled away really quite rapidly and there are economic implosions in some of these Asian nations. Ultimately, I think of this as a crisis about private sector debt and overexpansion with an especially rapid trigger. Sometimes you can cite higher interest rates for inducing foreign crises because capital then flows back into the United States. So this is all generally accurate. I would agree um, with this um, assessment of why was the money all of a sudden leaving um, East Asia. But I tend to think of that as not really the primary consideration here. What surprise is just how rapid and extreme some of these economic implosions were. So if we look at Thailand, we see a negative growth rate of more than negative 10%. You can think of the Asian financial crisis as basically starting in Thailand. So in February of 1997, there's a Thai property developer which gets into serious financial trouble. And perhaps that was the first trigger event. But the crisis really is taking off in the summer of 1997 when there is a collapse in the Thai currency, namely the baht. So also, probably what he's not going to mention here is that the leader of Thailand, who's pictured here, had been king, um, he only died a few years ago, uh, but he was the longest serving king um, of Thailand. And Thailand is known for having very strict laws against making fun of the president of Thailand, of um, doing anything that would hurt his reputation. He, again, he passed away just a few years ago, but I'm not even going to tempt fate and say anything bad about him. Um, Great guy, fantastic guy, um, trained at Harvard, uh, became, and while he was at Harvard, his father died, and so then he became king at some point in his early 20s, um, and then he was king all the way until he uh, passed away. Um, again, just a few years ago. And that's setting off the trigger, which is leading to these implosions in a lot of other Asian markets. Arguably, the crisis hit Indonesia the hardest, where for a while we were seeing a growth rate of more than negative 13%. The history of Indonesia here also reflects some of the more puzzling features of the crisis. So, for instance, in Indonesia, the government budget was in surplus, not deficit. The country was seeing export growth of about 10%, which, of course, is extremely healthy. And yes, they did have a current account deficit of about 3.5% of GDP. Obviously, in retrospect, that seems too high, but it was relatively low for the group. And prior to the crisis arriving, it was not obvious to most outside observers that this was going to be a sign of major trouble. One very controversial angle of the history of Indonesia... So this would be pretty important, this part. Um, not that I was waiting five minutes to get to this point, but he's given a pretty good description so far, one I largely agree with. Um, he has a bit more data than I had in front of me, so... Um, there's still some value in what he said. Asia here is that the country then had to adopt an IMF adjustment plan where it was called upon to cut government spending and raise interest rates in order to bring the economy into adjustment. 
Joseph Stiglitz, among many others, argued that IMF policies were simply making the crisis worse and that this was not a good time for the Indonesian economy to be experiencing austerity. This, of course, was a precursor of more current debates about austerity in the Eurozone and other places. The Asian financial... Uh, what he's meaning by that is in the 2008 financial crisis when... Um, Greece and later Ireland and Portugal were all running out of money, um, the pig countries. Um, the IMF, to help it out, was going to require pension reform and a reduction in government spending for them to get help. The crisis came relatively late to South Korea, which for a while seemed like it would be protected from most of the crisis, and of course was then and still is wealthier than most of the other Asian economies. Nonetheless, toward the latter half of 1997, South Korea did experience a bankruptcy of many of the leading chai bowls, and the country saw a kind of financial meltdown where capital flowing in from outside stopped. This is like the sudden stop we discuss in one of the other videos. And again, there's a kind of economic implosion where probably the key vulnerability was simply too much... I don't understand. Is this actually... Um... Um, I'm guessing that someone from the United States is shaking the hand or IMF is shaking the hand of a South Korean. Um, I don't see that in this picture. Much borrowing by leading conglomerate chai bowl corporations and that borrowing often being denominated in foreign currencies. And also, I, I will say this too. That's a little bit, um, you know, we can all... Um, be critical of the the Scheibels, um the family-run companies that are so important in South Korea. But how an economy organizes itself, one shouldn't think that theirs is superior to another. And I think he's being a little bit too harsh of the South Koreans. I mean, family-owned companies, big, large, industrialized, family-owned companies in South Korea is just the way that the economy has organized itself. And I personally don't think it's um, correct to say that the U.S. version is better than that. It's just different. I focused on a few of the leading locales for the Asian financial crisis, but it also significant. Okay, um, just because I think he's going off a little bit more than I wanted him to. Um, let's go back to this. <laughs> so... Then there's a connection between that, the East Asian financial crisis, which is happening in 1997, 1998, and then the dot-com bubble, which some of the older students of you in this class would have some familiarity with. This would have been my first um, economic crisis that I would have been aware of. Um, the East Asian financial crisis obviously didn't affect me directly. I was aware that it was occurring, but it was kind of like, all I just remember is that there was this one kid in my college class who was from Malaysia, and he had a hard time paying his tuition bill. That was my only recollection of there being an East Asian financial crisis. This one was obviously more readily apparent. Um, so between 1982 and 1999, as the book points out, U.S. stocks increased by a factor of 13. We've never, ever, ever seen that. And it just kept going up and up and up and up. And that the value of stocks, the market capitalization of stocks, was three times that the size of the GDP. So everyone kept saying that this growth could keep happening because the economy was new. The internet was changing everything. And there was all this capital that came from venture capital firms. And loan standards were relaxed. And the central bank created a lot of money because they were concerned about Y2K. This idea that computers weren't going to recognize that it was the year 2000 and they thought it was going to be the year 1900. So there was like this dooms. Still, at the time, this is when I was at the Fall Reserve, that um, I had to work December 31st, 1999 because there was this concern that people would go to their ATMs on January 1st of 2000 and it wouldn't work because the ATM would think it's 1900 rather than 2000. It turns out to have not been any concern. But what then starts to happen is that by March of 2000, um, there's then a beginning of the reduction in the money supply because then the Federal Reserve realized they didn't need to have all that money out there. 
the tax rate changed as well, so then people are chasing returns and investing in more of these internet stocks. And again, it's kind of a weird internet, it's a weird bubble, asset bubble, because there actually isn't any physical land here. It really is um, all stocks, internet stocks. So with that in mind then, the, the question then becomes, how do we connect all these things? How do we... Um, how do we connect these crises together? And then based on that, should the government do anything to intervene in this? And there's basically two schools of thought. Some that think that the central bank is really smart and it can stop it. And then Austrians who think that once you start bailing people out, that you create moral hazard. Moral hazard meaning that people stop being responsible for their actions because they know they'll be um, covered if they make a mistake. So a moral hazard would be like, I have car insurance, so I start to drive recklessly because I have car insurance and I know I won't be responsible. So then the insurance companies make steps to ensure that my interests are aligned with theirs, right? So my insurance rates go up if I drive recklessly. Uh, maybe I won't be covered if I'm like doing something like committing a crime or drinking and driving, those kinds of things. And one of the biggest critiques of crises is that usually the reaction to a crisis is that more regulations are imposed. And this most recent crisis is no um, exception to this. We saw Dodd-Frank passed in 2010 as a result of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. But usually what this does, and this is what we're living in the times of right now, where Dodd-Frank then forces money to get outside of Dodd-Frank regulations and moves to other sectors of the economy. So now, whereas real estate is much more heavily regulated, car loans are not. And you can see actually a lot of examples of really bad, really nasty car loans out there that are kind of the source of the next crisis, something that I will ask you about um, on this first take-home exam. Um, I didn't want to type in all the quotes here, but there, there were obviously a pretty interesting series of quotes in the crisis and ways to talk about bank runs and how do you stop people from panicking, like suspending bank statements. You do see the circuit breakers more often. Um, um, I think you would see it. Here, I don't want to watch a 10 minute video. How do you test a circuit breaker? Um, well, let's just look at the very beginning of this. Um, so there's a pretty famous example of a flash crash that occurred in 2010. Um, and the person actually just recently went to jail that um, they think had um, caused part of it. Let's just see just a part of this here. Broken, uh, down 10, you were down, I was actually starting, you know, it was 400 points ago. I, I was 500 points ago when I sat down. It wasn't of interest. Kind you know, of interest here. Kind of yeah. 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 There was, there was, there was yeah. a moment today. Mohammed al was on Power Lunch today. And, and here's the one thing that he said that kind of got us all very uneasy. Is when he said, we've been talking to banks in Europe. And now, remember back during Lehman when people didn't want to right. lend to each other because of Lehman? Now it's... That's what's happening right, by European right. banks. So overnight rates are starting to climb. They're starting to get nervous. And you're seeing right. fragility in the credit system right. there. And there's concern that we get fragility in the credit right. system so here. You, you, we're not in the right. same position. we got a lot more capital in the banks than we right. did before. But we're also much higher. Okay, so I'm just going to fast forward this here a bit here. It was so down nine other points. I mean, look at that. Procter & Gamble, you could have gotten it for $58. That would have been, that would be a fantastic deal compared to uh, ticker symbol PG, what the... Prices of Procter and Gamble today, I think it's like ninety dollars a share. So you would have made a lot of money um, had you bought this. Let's 
skip ahead here to the end. On the way down, and all of a sudden, it just stopped on a dime and turned off. And it, all of a sudden, all of a sudden here, we started hearing screaming, bye, bye, bye orders. Oh, oh, what was, what was going orders. on at that moment? All of a sudden, I, everybody started getting bye orders coming in down. So basically then... Um, what happens in this weird little situation is that the algorithms that underline stock buying and selling, it's not really people, it's machines basically following formulas, algorithms, um, were all engaged in selling. And then when one starts to sell, then the algorithm tells the other machine to sell, and it keeps going down and down and down until it hits an inflection point, and then the machines all then say, bye, bye, bye. And that's kind of what he's talking about here by minute seven of this eight-minute video. So, um, but basically you can start doing those circuit breakers to stop um, things um, from getting worse. I'm not going to show it to you, but I probably will watch this after my lecture. Um, just because I'm actually a little bit curious about it, I probably will end up watching this documentary. So if you're more curious about that flash crash, um, actually, you know what? We don't do any extra credit. Um, I will make an extra credit assignment based on watching this video um, with a reflection paper. Um, but... Um, the reflection paper can replace, um, can add some extra points to your exam. So I won't make it like low points value like a reflection paper, but I'll make it high points in exam. Oh, look at that little nugget that I just buried there. Um, <laughs> and then in the United States, we obviously have the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. And we don't see a lot of examples of banks failing. In fact, we really only have one example of a major bank failing between 1934 and 1970. But then things really start to change um, after that. And that's what takes us to Chapter 11. What does it mean to be um, a central bank? And what does it mean to be a lender of last resort? So that is a critical feature of any central bank in a developed economy, is that it lends money when no one else will. But as straightforward as that seems, it's actually not straightforward. Even in 2009, um, 2008, 2009 financial crisis, it was not clear, even with the Federal Reserve, it did not lend money to Lehman Brothers, but it did lend money to AIG and to Bear Stearns. So... It's not right, and then it eventually lent out money to money market funds. So it's not entirely clear what the Federal Reserve will do and what it perceives as its role as the lender of last resort. But it is critical to stopping the panic that exists when the bubble is popping. <coughs> and that concludes with a discussion of Chapter 12 where we then have a criticism of the IMF, which I basically have already talked about. So that takes us through um, Chapter 12. Um, I'm going to create a video assignment for um, the next video, um, that if you want to watch it as extra credit. Um, but um, we're going to be then basically over the next two weeks finishing up this book. And it's probably the hardest part of this course is finishing up this book. And then it gets a little bit more... Um, relevant and a little bit more um, modern day uh, than what we've been talking about thus far.